How about that cigar? How about that cigar? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening or this morning or this afternoon, whenever you are watching this broadcast. For those of you watching live, thank you so much for spending this evening with us. Today is April 28th, 2020, and this is episode number 56 of How About That Cigar Live. Can you believe 56. it? 56 episodes. Thank you guys so much, as always, Man. for spending your Tuesday evening with us. Tuesday, as always, is our absolute favorite night of the week. Even in this lockdown situation that we find ourselves in, we're so grateful to have the cigar culture, the cigar community that we love so much. Uh, those of you who have not been able to continue to spend some of these, spend some time, you know, doing what we've been doing, which is having herfs on online, you know, getting together with your cigar smoking friends online on Zoom or Skype or Facebook. Uh, continue to stay involved in the cigar community. It's really important. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank you guys so much. As always, we are coming to you live from the Drew Estate Cigar Studios. And Drew Estate wants to announce the spring seasonal release of their infamous Flying Pig Vitola, including Liga Pravada Number no. 9, T52, Undercrown Maduro, Shade, and Sun Grown, and Kentucky Fire Cured. Starting with the Kentucky Fire Cured Flying Pig with Kentucky Seed Tobacco Grown and Fire Cured in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, Undercrown Maduro Flying Pig features a Mexican San Andreas Maduro wrapper, and the Undercrown Shade Flying Pig with an Ecuadorian Connecticut Shade wrapper. Then we have the Undercrown Sun Grown Flying Pig featuring a Sun Grown Sumatra wrapper. Rounding out the release, the Liga Pravada Number no. 9 features a Connecticut Broadleaf wrapper. And finally, the Liga Pravada T52 featuring a Connecticut River Valley Stock Cut and Sun Cured Habano wrapper. For more information on all of that, please visit DrewEstate.com. So we're in week number 74,221 of lockdown. It's not really, but it feels like it sometimes. I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, uh, you know, hopefully everybody out there is is healthy and, you know, staying, you know, active to the point where you can kind of keep your mind off of things and stay busy with projects around the house. Hopefully you're still working in some capacity from home. I am. My wife is. My kids are going to school from home. Um, and you know, we just really hope that you guys are able to kind of stay sane. I'll be honest. I kind of, and I told Garrett this yesterday, I sort of hit a little bit of a wall on Friday. It wasn't severe. I wasn't lying on the floor in a, you know, the fetal position, you know, crying for mommy, but you know, I kind of yes. just hit, I kind of hit the wall a little bit where I was just sick and tired. I was, I had cabin fever. I was sick and tired of being cooped up. So, but, uh, you know mm -hmm. what, you know, what really helped? going to Costco the next day and spending an obscene amount of money. Yeah. It helped. Oh, I'm not going to lie. It, it helped. Does. So, uh, you know, you guys do whatever makes you happy during these times. Uh, and, and like I said earlier, spend some time online with your friends. Some, if you haven't done this yet, if you haven't gone on zoom or, or had one of these virtual herfs mm -hmm. with, with some of your cigar smoking friends, try it out if you haven't tried it yet it feels a little awkward at first it's a little different than sitting across each other on some couches at a nice comfortable lounge but try it out it's because it's very important to not just isolate ourselves you know away from the rest of the world so yeah no yeah. it's uh it's a good time and there are a few uh you'll find that uh, you have a few friends who like the camera a lot more than maybe they thought they did true story true story and uh they 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 might make it a little more uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it Just, is okay. You know, um, and, and as always guys, we're, we're really excited that we can, you know, come to you live on Facebook. If you would right now, while you're, while you're watching live on Facebook or on YouTube, take just a quick moment, if you would, and share this broadcast, uh, hit the share button and you can also share it out. If you're members of any Facebook cigar groups, go ahead and share it out there so we can, uh, uh, reach as many people as possible. Um, this evening, as we get into our special main segment, we want to remind you, as always, that this segment is brought to you by Corona Cigar Company and CoronaCigar.com. They are the Internet's largest and easiest to use virtual cigar store. Corona Cigar Company offers you the finest handmade cigars, humidors, and cigar accessories at the absolute lowest possible price. At Corona Cigar Company, they take pride in being cigar fanatics just like you and me. You will also find unique and limited cigars containing Florida sun-grown tobacco. As a proud American, 
President and founder of Corona Cigar Company, Mr. Jeff Borshowitz, believed it was possible to bring cigar tobacco farming back to Florida. At Corona Cigar Company and CoronaCigar.com, you'll find the best selection anywhere in the world of cigars containing this special Florida sun-grown tobacco. If you live in Florida or are just visiting, be sure to visit any of the great Corona Cigar locations in downtown Orlando, Sand Lake, Lake Mary, and also the Davidoff of Geneva Lounge in Tampa. For more info on all of that, please visit coronacigar.com and floridasungrown.com. So guys, I want to welcome right now our special guest to the show. And it would take me a while to describe and, and, and call out all the things that this guy does for us in the cigar industry. So I'm just going to bring him on. Please welcome to the show, Dave Garofalo. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Let me let me get this right. I am brought to you by Corona Cigars. Isn't yes, that something? <laughs> Jeff Borshowitz, thank you. Thank you, my <laughs> buddy Jeff Borshowitz. <laughs> brought to you by Corona Cigar. Uh, <laughs> can you believe it? He's a good man. He's a yes, good man. I, yes. Listen, I, I know how it goes with, with the uh, with the sponsorships and things. How's that that goes? So he's a good man for uh, sponsoring a show like this, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so before we get into, you know, kind of the, the regular questions that we that we like to ask, just give us an idea of how things are going for you and your family, you know, during this lockdown time and what, what you're doing to stay sane besides enjoying fine cigars. Oh, knock on wood. I have a 89 year old mother li lives upstairs and uh, she's fine. And that, that's the uh, most important thing, worrying about yeah. the elderly and make sure she's OK. Um, my daughter's living downstairs in an apartment. She's from New York. But when all this broke out, she says, I'm coming home and uh, staying away from you for a couple of weeks. She's staying away a little longer than that. But uh, she, she's right there and, and my wife in the other room. So family wise is good. And uh, as it goes for, you know, we have three retail shops. We are doing the curbside. We're uh, still in business, but I'll tell you, it's it's not much of a business. It's it's uh, it's pretty rough um, operating like that. But um, we're doing what we can. We have uh, employed, kept all our employees on, trying to do the right thing by everybody. But uh, this is a time for all brick and mortars. Uh, think about them because uh, it's a tough time for brick and mortars and. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, not everyone's going to come out of it alive. You know, I, I think yeah. it's going to take yeah. some some businesses down. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I try to support brick and mortar it, it, always uh, on a regular basis. I'm a big believer in brick and mortar, everything. And uh, this is a time, if there's ever been a time, you can throw an extra cigar over to the brick and mortar guy. Please do it. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, uh we didn't kind of do our normal sports thing opening because there's not a lot of sports. Yeah. Matt, Matt <laughs> just kind of skipped over I the don't, NFL draft. I don't know what you're talking about. I know anything and, about any draft. Well, yeah, being in that. New England, I don't know much about it either. Draft. <laughs> yeah. Air coming in from the other room, a draft. What? Yeah. Yeah. Because exactly. uh, New England, yeah. Does New England have a team? Do not they? Really. they <laughs> not really. It's a it's just a, one of the greatest dynasties in nfl history in, in yeah. sports history gosh but, but, did you watch I'm, did you pay attention to the draft at all david i watched a little bit of it and they didn't come up after the first half hour 45 minutes so they went into the second round i said okay that's enough of that yeah. uh and yeah. and then they didn't get a quarterback either um I right. got a lot of buddies in Tampa, so they're going to have a great team over there, I think. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, they are. Yes, they. Uh, all the videos that uh, Brady and uh, Gronk released yeah. were just hilarious and great. And, you know, if nothing else, it, it's been a fun story, and it'll be fun to watch and, and, uh, and see what they do down there. They're going to yeah. have a Super Bowl in Tampa no matter what. You know that, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's what a Super Bowl is. So yeah. <laughs> wouldn't it be something if it's them anyway? So man. So, well, yeah. Garrett's I mean, Garrett's ribbing me because I you know, we're here in Minnesota, <laughs> but I'm a I'm a diehard Green Bay Packers fan. I have been for over 30 years. And Garrett is, of course, born and raised in Minnesota. He's a diehard Minnesota Vikings fan. Mm -hmm. Uh the Vikings had a really, really good draft. Stellar draft. And the Packers had Probably a lot of analysts are saying they had the worst draft of any team in the NFL, that their their moves were mind boggling and made no sense. And I'm with them. I don't know why they were doing what they were doing, but 
what are you, you know, do? even though that I, you know, I a Minnesota fan, um, I still have, you know, the Packers would be, you know, realistically, they would be my second favorite team. You know, I'm, if I'm going to be honest, I'm not that Viking fan who is like the Packers going to, you know, they need to die. And, you know, um, there's a lot of that, but my hope is that this Lafour is some crazy genius and he's doing something that we just don't get yet. You remember Moneyball, the baseball movie? Oh, yeah. Great movie. Right? It didn't make any sense. And then yep. here they go. But that's yep. what I'm hoping that's happening out there for the Patriots because that doesn't sure. make any sense to me. And I go, maybe they're so much smarter than me. And uh, <laughs> this is Moneyball here. Let's see what yeah. happens. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Dave, obviously – we were so excited to have you on the show because mm-hmm. we're we're fans because you know we we listen to and we watch the Cigar Authority podcast. We're we're you know patrons of Two Guys Cigars, and you you wear so many different hats in the cigar industry, and and you're you're so busy with so many different things, and um and plus the fact that you have been involved in the the premium cigar industry for so long, um mm-hmm. you know and and. Our biggest thing here with How About That Cigar is consumer education. We want consumers to learn more so that they can, you know, be better members of the cigar community. And that's why it's so great to have you on here because there's so much that we can learn from you. So give us a little bit of an idea about, you know, that first time that you sat down with a premium cigar and, you know, how it led into uh, the, the love that you have today for them. Well, I, um, I always liked the aroma of somebody smoking a cigar and appalled by people smoking cigarettes. It was the weirdest thing. Mm-hmm. And I had an uncle that was a cigar smoker and a, a pipe smoker. Um, back in the day, you could even, you know, a kid could go to the store and buy tobacco products. I remember buying cigarettes for the neighbors and stuff like that and doing errands. And one of the things um, would be I would buy my father's cigars for birthdays holidays and things like that and my father wasn't a cigar smoker and he'd be like what are you doing what are you doing Sell, buying me cigars i took a liking to it and uh didn't even realize it till years went on and um I, i've been in a lot of different businesses over the years until i found cigars on a personal level and I was a nightclub disc jockey for 12 years back in the disco days in the late <laughs> 70s through the 80s. And um, what I would do is on my way to work, uh, I would buy a big cigar on the way to go into work for the club. And I would light that cigar when uh, the, the night began for me. And we used to call it playing to the ashtrays. It's before anybody came to the club. The music would start, but there's nobody there yet. The bouncers are lined up. Waitresses are getting ready. And I'd start playing music. And then people would dribs and drabs in there. And I would smoke a cigar till the cigar got to the end. By the time it got to the end, it was basically showtime for me. And then I would really start paying attention and start working the, the dance floor. And uh, I did that for 12 years. And um, as some time was coming on and some of my buddies would come in uh, getting at the tail end of my cigar and they would see me smoking a cigar, which they would never see on a regular basis. But I did it every night and they would say, what are you doing smoking that cigar? And I said, well, I like it. And, uh, you know, they say, what are you trying to be a big shot or whatever? Because that was the the (laughs) thought process in the uh, in the 80s, 70s and 80s was big shot smoke cigars. And I said, I just do this before the people come and relaxes me, gets me ready for the night. And uh, they said, oh, this is crazy. The same people later on, um, for about three years, I had two guys smoke shop and the nightclub business going on at the same time and wishing and praying that the two guys smoke shop would do well enough that the day would come that I could end up giving up the nightclub business, which at the time I liked it. But the problem in the nightclub business is. I stay. I got older, and the audience stayed the same age. Yeah, and I started getting to be a creep. I don't know. I felt like a creep. I said, "I have to. I have to get out of this thing," and uh, let me get a smoke shop going. The smoke shop's going. I'm doing okay. And then I, I just had to wait until it, I felt like I could. I was doing very good in the nightclub business too, and I had to wait until um, I felt like I could make the move. And when I did, it was the best thing I did because then I could concentrate a hundred percent on the business that I wanted to be in. And then I was able to open store number two, store number three, and it it grew very quickly after that. And as luck would have it, so did 1990 came along. 
Cool. So I had three stores going, and 1990 came along, and I'm ordering more and more cigars. There were no cigar stores, by the way. It was smoke shops. That's why we're called Two Guys yeah. Smoke Shop. And that's because we had to carry all kinds of things. And we did have all kinds of stuff. And as 1990 came and more and more we started selling more cigars, more things were being pushed to the side and more cigars were being added. By the time 1992 came, Cigar Aficionado comes out. And I said, you know something? I'm going to make the call here. I'm getting rid of everything else, and we're going to be cigars only. And that was 1992. We went cigars only, and it's been growing ever since. The cigar boom takes off, uh, and we're sailing along up until uh, and through 1997. 1997, it ends, and um, this is where I feel like we are right now, that with this coronavirus thing that happened, um, when... 1998 came, a lot of cigar shops went out of business. And mm. what happened to Two Guys Smoke Shop is during the worst of times, we actually grew at the same time, you know, and that's not the way I want to have my growth. I want to earn my growth and I don't want it from businesses that are, go that are going to go under. But I think that's what's going to happen, that we're going to see some tragedies happen that people can't handle the, um, the, the costs that keep coming in because, you know, it's not just the labor cost. Our rents still come in. The electric bills stump keep coming in. The phone, the internets, all the bills keep coming in month after month and less yep. or no money comes in in some, some cases for some of the retailers that are out there. So, uh, that that's a long answer to uh, how how would I like my first cigar? Yeah. It came it came in uh, it came in from um, just trying to kill some time before the crowd came in. No, that's great. And honestly, you 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 helped me out because you you answered my first three questions. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that's that's what you get for having a host of another that's podcast right, right, come right. on here, right? That's yep. right. Now, I, now I get to ask you guys some questions. No, no. There I don't you go, there you go. <laughs> but uh, Garrett and I want to tell everybody we yeah. are smoking the La Giana this evening. So um, part of this is, you know, this is another part of, of one of the hats that you wear. And that is, you know, being part of a brand, being a part owner of a, of, of a brand. Uh, or a line of cigars, you know, everything from from Atabe, you know, to La Giana and in between. So so give us an idea, you know, uh, b correct me if I'm wrong. This cigar is named after your daughter. Is that right? It is. It is. It yeah. Maybe, she, maybe she's listening on. I'm smoking the Maduro right now. La Giana Maduro. And um, this was um, me and my daughter, me and my wife were going to have a baby. And um, we found out it was going to be a girl. And I was saying to myself, okay, this was 1994. And um, I said, you know, it's a boy and girl cigars was a big thing then that people always came in and got cigars for celebrations uh, when they were having a baby. And I said, when three stores at the time, and I said, when I have a baby, this is going to be a lot of cigars I'm going to need. <laughs> so uh, why don't I just make a cigar and have her name actually put on it? And her name was going to be Gianna. So La Giana, there was La Gloria Cubana, there was La Flor Dominicana. So it's the female version of whatever it is. So her name's going to be Gianna. Let's make La Giana. And um, we had the people at Camacho uh, making the cigar. Um, there was no Camacho at the time, so it was, it was Carib Imports. And yeah. we had them make the cigar for us. And um, they were making Nat Sherman's at the time. They were making a lot of cigars for a lot of people and a little cigar, little amount of cigars for themselves. And um, I took the cigar in. We handed them out. And we had the baby. And everybody said, this cigar is great, you guys. This is unbelievable. I love that cigar. Can I get more of that cigar? That cigar is fantastic. So I said, you know something? Let me make a whole bunch of these cigars. And I ordered another big batch, maybe four times the size of the first batch I made, not realizing that they loved the free cigar. It, it wasn't so much the cigar. It was, it was, it was free. Imagine uh, that. Yes, yes. So I, hey, I was young at the time. And uh, so it wasn't so much that they loved the cigar so much. They loved the, the price, which was zero. 
and um, but but a brand was born at that point, and yeah. um, we just kept it going. And over the years, we added sizes, we added wrappers, we did uh, all kinds of different different things with it. Um, and it was actually not my first cigar. We made Dos Ombre, meaning two guys. And that was from a, a lady at the bank that used to walk in the store and she used to say Dos Ombre. Mm. Uh, she was a Spanish woman and she would, I, I still know it to this day, Diana Rivera. And she said, uh, Dos Ombre, Dos Ombre. And I said, what do you say every time you come in? I don't know what, what that means. And she says, I'm saying two guys. And I said, how do you spell that? And we actually made a brand. Yeah. So th- we're talking, and that was probably in the 80s sometime, and this was um, 94. And since then, any time that they needed, there, there was a product that needed to be there that didn't exist, I would try to create. And that was actually La Giana Maduro because there wasn't a product like La Giana Maduro. We had La Giana, but I'll tell you what La Giana Maduro is. I'm not a big Maduro cigar smoker because I tend to find Maduro too strong. And the fact of the matter is Maduro is not strong. Maduro is ripe. The idea of a Maduro Mm -hmm. wrapper on here has a sweetness to it. Mm -hmm. And it's aged longer and it makes it a a sweeter component. But the manufacturer realizes that the U.S., which is the majority of cigar smokers, they believe that the U.S. people – think that Maduro is strong. And that's a fact. They do think that as a retailer for 35 right. years. I'm telling you, people say, oh, a dark cigar, they're too strong. Yeah. And the manufacturer decided to juice up the Maduro cigars, put higher primings inside of them, make them stronger, because that's what the U.S. consumer believed that cigar was. Because mm-hmm. the problem was, if they put a cigar out that was mild in Maduro, the Maduro smoker, the guy that wants a strong cigar, wouldn't like the cigar because it's too mild. And somebody, if it was a mild cigar, had a Maduro wrapper on it, the mild cigar smoker would never buy it because they look at it as dark and they say, no, it's strong. So the workmanship that goes into making that wrapper, all the hard work that goes into making it properly, makes the same cigar sweeter. Mm -hmm. And the problem is most companies don't do it. So I wanted to produce the same cigar, the La Giana, but now add that sweetness to it, put the Maduro on it, and now you have a mild cigar that has some sweetness to it, natural sweetness through the process of Maduro. So that's what I did with it. There isn't a lot of options when it comes to that, but with that also is a hand sell, let me tell you for sure, because we have to show somebody, oh, you should try the Maduro version of that, And and I see it to this day, and it's been all these years, 26 years of the cigar, of somebody saying, oh, no, I don't like Maduros, they're too strong. And I said, well, this one isn't too strong. You should try it for the value of what Maduro is, because don't be afraid of Maduro. But then again, yes, the Maduro version of Brand X and Brand X and Brand X is stronger than the natural ver- natural version. So that's what ended up happening with this cigar we're smoking today. And is this the same cigar that uh, you put out in 94? Yes. So. Over the years, things have changed, and the Camacho company was sold off to Davidoff. And mm-hmm. still Davidoff makes, now Davidoff makes makes it in Honduras, though, where they make Camacho. But there was, this was before Camacho was even Camacho. Uh, but they're still making it, yes. Yeah, Fantastic. And, and back, I mean, you know, when you, when you came out with Dos Hombres, which you said was late 80s, and then even going into the early mid-90s, um, a lot of people who are smoking premium cigars today and have only been smoking for five years, 10 years, which don't get me wrong. And it's not like that's a short time to smoke premium cigars. But if you go back to the, the around the time the two guys launched and, and even into the cigar boom, Maduro's were still uh, far less common mm-hmm. than than lighter, milder cigars. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And then yeah. there was, there was uh, EMS, Brown Wrappers, English Market Selection, and there was AMS, which is Claro, the green cigars. There was probably more green cigars than there mm-hmm. were dark cigars or black cigars at the time. And you like brands like Punch would come out with the Maduro. And, you know, the, you'd see the following of there. And again, a stronger version 
of a punch was to punch Maduro. Uh, and why? Because they were beefing it up on purpose. And I had the conversation with the, with all the companies over time, and I would always get the same thing. The reason why we're doing it is the consumer thinks it's strong. They're unhappy if it's not. we got to give them what, what they want, which makes sense. But that's just the, the misconception of the consumer of, of and especially back then lack of education right so the consumer was never educated and that is the difference of what happens today yeah. i think the consumer wants this they want what you provide and give them the information what it is and they're a smarter smoker for it but still the manufacturers are still back on the the old days of saying this is what the consumer wants but i think um we can uh now teach them that it doesn't have to be that way. Something's popping up on here. Almost time to restart. Do I have to click something here? Um, oh, I, that might be on your computer. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's on your. You can just so, you ignore, click ignore. Uh, or okay, thank you. It. Sorry, I yeah, usually have a guy away. here for that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, if if I may, so between the you know late eighties and 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 nineties, producing a cigar, what's different today? when you go through the process of, hey, we froze up on me. I'm going to put out a thing. All right, please hold. Oh, we're back, I think. There yeah, you are. I think you are. Was yeah, that we're you? Back. We, just, we just had a little internet glitch. Okay. It's with the, the times we're living in right now, you know, uh, internet problems have been rampant all over the country. So just... uh I think we're back. We're good. Okay. Did you uh, did you uh, get the question? I Dave? did not. Okay, so um, the difference between uh, making a cigar in the '80s and '90s versus making a cigar today, what does that look like? Uh, a lot more complex. A lot more options. Uh, lots more tobacco. Um, you know, before it was pretty cut and dry that there was only so many varietals that were there and here's your choice of what you're going to do and that's it. And now these manufacturers will go out and source the tobacco you're looking for, uh, the countries um, swapping tobacco and selling tobacco to each other. You'd go to Dominican and you'd have, besides the wrapper, it would be a Dominican binder and filler, zero Nicaraguan. And you go to Nicaraguan, it'd be the same, you know, th it wasn't a lot of uh, swapping around. And, um, you know, now with, with uh, you know, Mexico and Costa Rica and, uh, you know, there's so many options of, of what people are doing. And that's because these growers are learning a lot. They're, they're, uh, you had Klaus Peter on uh, last week. I mean, it, uh, his dad did so much of, um, you know, basically putting two, uh, seeds together and creating a new varietal and these things happen over the years and growing certain tobaccos in places that it wouldn't grow i mean it connecticut was from connecticut you know that's the way it was and now you can get connecticut in ecuador you can get it in honduras you can get it in the dominican they're growing it all over the place as is cameroon is starting to grow in other places now um, and believe it or not when some of these things you say I remember when Ecuador started growing Connecticut seed and they said, oh, but it's the cheaper version because it's not real and all that stuff. And then the next thing you know, I think they're making a better product, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that that happen. You know, so lots of change up happen. And these, you know, I hear a lot of people saying I'm the blender, I'm the blender or whatever it is. I go by the, the pro. Let me tell you, I, I've sat with them before and I say, what about this? And they shake their head and I say, well, I want to try it with this because I think this is it. And the guy does it for me and then we let him rest and then we, we smoke him and it's awful. And he looks at me like gringo, you know, <laughs> whatever. And I go, I know, I know. I just, it's been bothering me that I think this works with that. And he goes, let me explain to you why it doesn't work. And they know, they know. So, you yeah. know, I, I've, I've gone, you know, too far with a manufacturer before listen what i'm do what i tell you i want to be done i'm the guy paying for it and then i learn my lesson of you know i'll have to sit down with them and when they end up saying to me no this isn't going to work uh it's not going to be good they know so yeah I, I i i go by them more than i go by my my own i know what i want but you know they know yeah so in the time and and by the way uh, i'd be remiss if we didn't say happy 35 years to two guys cigars you're having a yeah. you're having a big uh, hopefully if everything hopefully. works out you're having a you're having a big uh, 
a big soiree in uh, September, I believe. Is that right? Yes. So I, I'm, I, we wish you the best. We hope Thank that that, uh, that that event can actually take place. And um, so in the 35 years, besides the fact that we already talked about, you know, strength, you know, because now in 2020, a uh, cigar that people considered to be uh, mild to medium uh, back in 1992, people would have thought was, you know, a, a, you know, uh, off the charts strong. So besides besides the tastes of consumers kind of changing and and uh, some consumers, you know, demanding more strength from their cigars, what other changes have you seen over the years that are really notable when it comes to things like consumer buying habits or consumer behaviors, things like that? What, what have you seen over the last 35 years? Well, everything changed. Size is is a big thing that, you know, it was Corona's and Lonsdale's, you know, a Lonsdale was a big thing at the time. And we're talking a a six by 45, 44 um, Corona's um, then all of a sudden became uh, shape cigars, um, torpedoes and bellicosos and uh, any figurato was really hot there in the early nineties. And then all of a sudden now we see today big ring gauges where, you know, a 50 ring gauge was a big cigar, you know, back then. And um, it's, you know, I, somebody hands me a cigar now and it's a 50 ring gauge. And I say, what do we have about a 46 here? And he says, no, that's a 50. And I'm like, <laughs> really? And looking at a 60, which I used to look at as, as a cartoon when somebody handed me a 60, <laughs> I'll never smoke that, is more of an average cigar with 70s and 80s and stuff out there now. So yeah. bigger cigars, um, you know, even um, um, like Churchill, which was a big cigar at a, maybe a 47 ring gauge, 7 by 47, not so big anymore. Churchill's are, are not the thing. A Gordo would be a much big seller than a Churchill or a Torpedo would be today. So these things have c- completely changed around. Um, and actually – they don't even make sense because people have less time. They cannot smoke in most places. Therefore, smaller cigars should be more popular, but it's not the case. So you can't even, you can't even figure it out. Why is this? It just is, you know, and and having the, the three stores that I have online presence and everything that I have. And that's why I like to do everything. I want to be part of every single thing because I can educate myself and know um, through all this information and be a better retailer for it by having the information, but you'd, you'd see all the change ups that ended up happening. Um, I think blending is a big, big thing now where, where it wasn't so much before of uh, the U S market likes blended scotches. They love blended foods and they love blended cigars. What puros used to be all the rage at one point. It is not so much anymore. When Opus X came out, it was a big, big deal because there was the a puro Dominican, the first yeah. time a Dominican wrapper was used on a cigar, everybody's going crazy because we finally have a puro Dominican. And many people came out with it afterwards. And the stuff that gets the attention nowadays is blended stuff, a Dominican using Nicaraguan tobacco and maybe, a, mm-hmm. you know, a, a wrapper from uh, Ecuador or, or wherever. All of a sudden, that's more interesting. Blending, different tastes and flavors that end up happening. So that became a big thing. It's, there's so many change-ups that end up happening. And I track this stuff. I look at it and I try to find trends early so that I can really get behind that trend on, on an early level instead of being the last guy uh, yeah. that figures that out. Well, and that's one of our, our viewer questions. Paul is asking, how do you try to stay ahead of the next trend? And, uh, you know, what uh, do you I mean, obviously, you have a lot of conversations with other people in the industry. But, you know, what are some of the things that you that, that you try to do to, uh, you know, just make sure you know what's going to happen? And the interesting thing is, you know, I talked about my life before as a disc jockey. As the disc jockey, the radio stations back in the disco days used to call the nightclub disc jockeys to ask them what's hot in the club, and they would decide what to play on the radio. Quite the opposite of of it is now, but we were the trendsetters. We would decide what to play in the clubs. The clubs would take to it, and then the, the radio stations would do it. This is what's happening in the cigar industry now that if you want to know what's happening as a trend that's happening in the cigar industry, you can't ask the manufacturer. The manufacturer is asking us 
because yeah. we're on the front line seeing what what change has happened. If you want to know early on, you check with the retailers that have a barcode system that have numbers to be able to do it, not the ones that are saying, "I think this is doing good. I think this is this is accurate numbers that we always did." I mean, I was the first guy using barcodes tracking this information because information is power, right? We end yep. up knowing early on what to do as the, as a buyer of a lot of cigars. Um, I need to know in advance of when something's dying off, not to be stuck with it. And you want to know when the next trend is so you can start loading up on that brand, that size, that particular strength profile, whatever it's going to end up being. So we're tracking numbers all the time. I love it. I love looking at the stuff and trying to figure it out. It's like trying to get a crystal ball, but you, you kind of got the answers here. So you can cheat yeah. on the test. The answers yeah. are there. Now dig them out and try to find out what's going on. This is another good viewer mm -hmm. question here. Uh, John Carney from LFD Cigars. He wants to know, do you feel, feel that the industry is behind in retail trends? Do you feel that the industry is behind in retail trends? The industry. I know the manufacturers are behind on retail trends because they're not in the front line, although some of them are. So some of them now are direct to consumer, so they can see some stuff. Um, some of them have cigar stores themselves, and they can see it. Um, so now they're getting to know what it is. All they had to do was ask. We didn't need the competition, us brick and mortar retailers. We didn't need the competition. All you had to do was ask me, I would have told you. Because uh, personally, I don't like them in, in it. You know, the our deal yeah. that we had with them was you sell to us and we sell to the consumer. That was the deal. You broke the deal and uh, so be it uh, of how it is. But um, it seems like uh, a lot of people are looking for it used to be from seed to smoke, but it's from seed to the retailer's hands. Um, so they're getting some information themselves now that they didn't get before. Um, a lot of them, um, you know, the older companies, this is the way we always did it. You know, I, I see in Cuba, they're still doing it the way we used to do it. And they, they with their heart, they say, you know, we've done it all this time. This is the way we did it. But it's, it got better, and you didn't get better. So they can't do that. They have to look at, you know, well, we always did it this way, but people are finding out better ways to do drip irrigation and, and uh, things that they do with the seeds and things like that. There's so much that ends up happening out there that I've seen over these 35 years of the old way they used to do it. And, and the old way they used to do it, they told me then, this is the way it's been done for hundreds of years. And... When somebody figured out the better way to do it, the next thing you know, the product got better and better. And yeah. I say it, and, I, and, and people rag on me a lot, of, a lot of times when I say it, but cigars have never been better today, ever, than they were. And every year they get better and better because the growers do it better. They've figured it out, and they get better and better and better as it goes on, and the product gets better and better. Along with it, it gets more expensive, too, at the same time. But the product is better than it's ever been, I yeah. know, from 35 years. What happened before that, I don't know. Yeah, well, I was probably a smoker for five years or so before that, but still, um, you know, just amazing what a cigar can be today. Uh, it burns better. It draws better. It smokes better. It's just a yeah. better product. Yeah. Um, Valerie's got a great question here. Um, she said, it's clear you have a passion for the business. How do you ensure succession with your retail staff? So I think maybe success uh, possibly is what she means. So so what what do you do to make sure that your that your staff is successful in, you know, uh, in what they're doing around the shops? OK, hi, Valerie. I know who she is. Um, <laughs> we train our staff. And um, it's an ongoing thing. It never ends. It's, uh, you know, when is training over? It's never over. It's never over for there me. It's go. never over for them. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a key fact that it's there. Um, we smoke cigar. If you go into our store and you see the worker there, a lot of times you'll see them that they have a cigar without a band on it. And we're testing them. Where, you know, let me know what you love about the cigar. Tell me what you like most about it. And uh, after that, tell me what country it comes from, what kind of tobacco's in here. Um, you know, and I want to get them out of their comfort zone also. I don't want them always smoking the same stuff. I want them smoking different things, even things that we don't carry. And that's an important factor, too, because somebody comes in and says, do you have brand X? And the answer is we can't have every single brand. So, no, we don't have brand X, but 
That is from Honduras, and it's grown by so-and-so, and and it's a medium-bodied cigar. Let me show you something that's going to be like it, and let me tell you, they're very, very good. You know, sometimes I'm caught up off guard for a second, and I'm thinking, and then one of the guys yells out, blah, 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 three of them in a row like this, and I'm like, wow, holy God. And that's part of it. We, we're to provide a service to the person that comes in, and that's for making the right recommendations. We don't just want them to sell them a cigar. We want to sell them the right cigar. And are we batting a 1,000? No, but we're way up there. I mean, we're damn good, I must say for my, to myself. Um, these guys got it, and they're always practicing and trying. And um, no, they don't like every single day thing they have. So when somebody mentions a cigar that they – particularly don't like they they can pick a cigar that's just like that that they don't like maybe too but you know what if you like that i think you're going to like this this is part of keeping the customer coming back each and every time because yeah. it's like cheers where everybody knows your name and and they see you and we know exactly what you like and i, I hear them say oh you know something i'm gonna let um so and so do it because every time i do it with him he uh he hits the nail on the head every single time and stuff. Oh yeah. Okay. Let, let him help you too. But frankly, they all could do it, you know, and even the younger guy that starts with us, it's a, it's about a three month um, learning thing. When somebody comes to work for us and I say it to them before they start, if you came here to stay for a few months, this ain't the type of job because the training is three months long. You're going to be paid while you're doing it, but you're going to be basically shadowing somebody until you become an expert of what this is. All we sell is one thing, cigars. That's it. Mm -hmm. And we we have from low, low end to high, high end and everything in between. We have something for everybody, but the the magic is to try to pick the right thing for the right person. And even, even a person that this is, I smoke brand X. That's all I smoke. That's what I love. And that's it. And it seems probably for people to come into us that we're trying to upsell them or trying to add on and sell something else to them. But we're doing that because they should try something else. And we're trying to get them. You should try at least one of these two, because if you're smoking the same cigar, Every single day, and that's all you're doing. First off, you're not listening to How About That Cigar because you're just, you're just smoking Marlboros and you're just drinking Bud Light. You're missing the whole fun of this yeah. whole industry, which is trying the next thing and getting out of your comfort zone and finding mm-hmm. the next, wow, my God, I found this, and I never thought I would have liked that. And that's the beauty of this industry. Yeah. And that reminds me of uh, my wife and I went to a restaurant, a uh, little local restaurant, um, off the river in, uh, off the river, uh, a few, oh, I want to say it was about a year ago and new restaurant, um, you know, doing fusion stuff, this new fancy chef. And, um, you know, we're talking to the waitress and, you know, I said, well, you know, this is what I like. And, you know, Jill saying what she likes and, you know, we order our food and we both loved it. And we're like, we can't wait to come back and, you know, have this again. And she said, well, here's a little thing that we do. Um, if you come back here, we're not going to let you order that same thing. again. <laughs> you can't. I loved it. Yeah, that's great. I, I like absolutely that. loved it. Uh, another thing, Dave, I, I love, uh, I love listening to you because it reminds me of listening to car talk. Um, uh, be one of I my, can't turn it off. I'm sorry. I, can't I know. It. No, but it's, don't, it's man. great. Own it and love it, cause cause I do. I miss uh, click and clack a lot, and uh, and uh, it was a great show. Yeah, that that's why I became a nightclub disc jockey. I wanted to be a radio disc jockey, and I worked at WBOS in Boston for about nine yeah. months, and they would not let me go on the air. I did everything, <laughs> and I said, "Please let me on the air." And they said, "We can't." You're New England accent is so terrible. You sound like a Bostonian. I said, I am a Bostonian, and this is WBOS Boston. Please let me in this. Yeah. And he said, no, you're going to have to get this out of you, and I just never could. I don't hear it myself. Well, it's yeah. Terrible. Yeah. No, but people say, people say it all the time. I'm, that's what it, I sound like, and I, I can't help it. So I want to talk a little bit about the next. So we've talked already about, you know, some of the different hats you wear in the cigar industry. And one of those is you participate a great deal and you contribute a lot of your time and a lot of your efforts to legislative matters. 
you're active with PCA, with CRA, with TAA, and the list goes on. And uh, Paul had a question, you know, uh, another question saying, what do you see as the biggest threat to the industry? And, you know, in my opinion, the biggest threat to the industry is, uh, uh, sadly, it's our own government. So what, it, you know, what, talk to us about how you first got involved in the legislative side and um, how that's grown and progressed over the years. So the cigar boom is what caused um, the attention onto cigars as opposed to OTP, other tobacco products. So it was 1994, 95, and the state of New Hampshire, the state of Massachusetts, where I had three stores in Massachusetts, said, we want to start taxing cigars. And it was already a sales tax they had implemented onto tobacco products because before there wasn't even a sales tax on it when I was in the business. They added sales tax on tobacco products. So now they said, we, no, we're going to put a tax on cigars. And I went to all the stores that were in Massachusetts in the Boston area at the time, and there were 30 of us. And I contacted them or I went into their stores. And here I am, a young kid, five years in the cigar business, and I had some retailers there that were 100-year-old uh, companies, big. Uh, those were the big guys that were there. And I said, listen, right, right up the hill, at the state house, they're uh, having a meeting and they're going to try to start taxing cigars. We have to go together and we have to go say that we're against this. And they said, get out of my store or um, you're my competitor. Um, don't call me. And it was one after the other. Nobody would join with me. And I said, OK, I'm going to have to fight by myself. And I went to the state house and I went and saw every senator, every House member, anybody that would listen to me. And I said to him, listen, it's a teeny, teeny industry. You're not going to make any money. What do you think you're going to make out of this? Well, we expect to make about three three million dollars for the children, for the children. <laughs> and I, I said, uh, no, you're not going to make that. And um you know, the, the people just aren't going to buy it and they're going to go to New Hampshire. Uh, Boston is 30 miles north of Boston is New, the border of New Hampshire. And I said, that's what's going to happen. And they said, well, we're going to see. And I said, you're looking for 30 percent. And they said, what if we cut that in half? What if we go to 15 or 12? How about that? And I said, nothing. I lived here my whole life. I know once you get your toes in the water, that's it. You're going to uh, you'll keep ramping it up and yeah. I'll end up losing my business. I leave the state house steps and it was a slow news day. There was news reporters there and they said, what's the problem? And here I am dressed up in a suit and tie and tr trying to impress them and leave, leave, leave us alone. And uh, I said, no, they want to tax premium cigars. And I have three retail shops in Boston. And if they do, I'm just going to close them down and I'm going to go across the border and start again in New Hampshire. And I left. And I thought that was the end of it until I got the newspaper the next morning, the Boston Globe, on the front page, above the fold, which is typically where they put the mass murderers and, <laughs> and all the major stories that end up happening. The Boston Globe, big newspaper. And there I am saying, um, if they implement this tax, I will close all three stores and move to New Hampshire. Yeah. And uh, I said, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and uh, I'm with my fingers crossed and continuing the fight and getting every anybody who would listen to me to fight along with me, but I couldn't get the retailers to fight along with me. And I kept calling them up and I said, listen, this is not going to go well. And they said, you know what? You made a big mistake. You made a big mistake. And uh, are you really going to leave after this happens? I said, yeah, I said I was going to leave. I'm going to leave. So as, as it would be, um, it was implemented at a 12% tax, floor tax added to that, meaning I would have to pay 12% on everything that already existed. And for 10 years at that point, I saved all my money and I just kept buying inventory with it. And I said, oh, my God, I'm going to either take that money and start again or I'm going to give that money to the government just for having it. So I said, the hell with it. And I closed the stores down and I started in New Hampshire. I crossed the border. And it took about two months to get the store open. But the day I opened, there was a line of my customers that were there. I said to those retailers in, in Massachusetts that I was going to take my customers with me. And they said, you think your customer is going to drive 30 miles north just to buy in your state for 12%. You bet they will. You bet they and will. And I said, I, I hope they did. And they did. And the fact of the matter is my customers came and their customers came too which is what I thought was going to happen to me. And by that happening, those 30 stores that existed 
went out of business because yeah. that tax went from 12 to 15 to 20 to 30 to 40. Yep. It's a 40% tax. And that's just exactly how I thought it was going to go is exactly how it did go. They refused to fight. And they went down with the ship. And unfortunate for them, I don't want their business, but unfortunate for them, they didn't fight. And if you don't fight, that's what ends up happening to you. And here we are in New Hampshire with, again, three stores, exit one off every major highway leading out of Massachusetts. Exit one is every two guys smoke shop, Salem, Seabrook, and Nashua, New Hampshire. Three highways that leave out of there and three stores because I consider myself still a Boston guy. And yeah. those are my customers. I just mm-hmm. brought it over there for them. As luck would have it, in New Hampshire, it's way different. We have an association in New Hampshire where we get together and we have a lobbyist. And there's only five of us in in the group, but there's five good retailers. And we get together every single month and we put aside our business of we're competitive with each other and we help each other. And we, we have no tax. There's only three states in the United States that don't have a tobacco tax. It's Pennsylvania, where every mail order operation operates out of. It's yeah. Florida, where every single manufacturer is operating out of. In New Hampshire, where yeah. David Garofalo and the group in New Hampshire is operating out of. It's not a coincidence that that is happening. It's a lot of hard work. It never stops. You can't sleep. You can't take your eye off the ball because it's going to come. And it's going to come yep. now with this epidemic that just that just went through. These these states are going to look be looking for money. Where do you think yep. they're going to go? They're going to go to low-hanging fruit. They're going to go to tobacco, cigars. How many people use cigars? One out of 1,000 people smoke premium cigars. One out of 1,000. That means 999 of them are happy that the tax would happen to us and not to them. So we have to fight. We have to fight and we can't let go. And that's what we, and it isn't easy. I hear other uh, retailers saying, oh my God, you know, I'm a, I'm a busy guy. I got a lot going on. I can't leave the store to go to the state house. Put a yeah. sign on the door and say, sorry, I had to go to the state house to try to stop this tobacco tax. Be back tomorrow or be back yeah. in two hours. I think the customer is going to appreciate it standing there yeah. and saying, you know something, this guy's fighting for us. Because yeah. the fact of the matter is, I am fighting for the consumer because ultimately, they are going to pay. Yep. When I get taxed, we just add it on to our cost of goods and then sell it out as, as, as there. So the consumer is going to pay one way or the other. So I'm fighting for the consumer. I'm fighting for my other retailers in the state. Unfortunately, the whole bunch of retailers who do not participate with us, we do the work for them. And they, from all our hard work, they, they gain. But it is what it is. We still yeah. have to do it. And you, you saw I did it alone. I'll do it alone if I have to. Yeah. But I take nothing away from the five guys in New Hampshire to stand up with us. Yeah. Amen. Damn, Dave, you got yeah. me all fired up. I know. I'm, I'm going to get on the phone tomorrow and call my congressman. Seriously, you got me all inspired. I love it. Well, Please. and so passion what, is what it takes. Yeah. Well, it does it take passion. Yeah. And so what, you know, do you educate uh, consumers or staff to use any resources to help fight? I've taken... Um, customers with me, uh, police and, and school teachers and doctors and things like that to say, come up and speak and everything. But it, it, ne- it never goes well. Um, you know, it, it becomes, I turns into a health issue when the fact of the matter is it's ways and means. All they really care about is dollars. Mm-hmm. But then explaining to them, you know, that states like Massachusetts, I get to tell the story to them that I moved out of the state. They, ma- they never made their $3 million and all the stores are gone. So yeah. I become the poster child of what I actually did and get to say that to him and say, listen, Florida's nice. I'm, I'm freezing up here in the winter time. My next step is Florida. Don't make me go to Florida. I like it up here. I got family here and everything. Yeah. Let me stay here and, because I'll do it. You'll make no money. And yeah. all you're going to do is, is, is lose more uh, family businesses for no reason. Yeah. There's no upside. Well, and like you, like you said earlier, you know, it's that incremental thing that, you know, it's that, that analogy you hear sometimes of the, you know, the, the, the frog in the water. If you throw a frog in a pot of boiling water, he's going to jump out right away. But if you throw a frog in a pot of cold water and you slowly bring it from cold up to boiling, the frog's going to die because it doesn't notice this, the drastic change. And people don't realize that a 4% tax increase today without fail is going to equal a 20 or 30% tax 
five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And 20 years may seem like a long time, but it's really the blink of an eye. And I've, lo- I've lost lobbyists fighting that worked for us. And they said, you know something, you got it's a give and take. You got to give a little. And I said, I'm giving them nothing. Don't give them anything. And he yeah. says, you're going to lose this one and you're going to get hurt really bad. Got to fire the lobbyists. We're looking for a lobbyist that will fight to the death with us and give them nothing. Because once they get something, that's it. And yeah. you, you just can't you just can't do it because they, they're playing the long game. You know, on the health aspect of it and the finance part of it and stuff, they play the long game. They wear you down. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me tell you, I've had days that I'm like, oh, my God, they're killing me here. But, you know, you get riled up again and you, you have a good night's sleep and you come back out and you say, OK, come on, yep. let's go. Yeah. So let's move. Let's move into the other hat, which is so take off the legislative hat and now put on the podcast hat because the Cigar Authority, Garrett and I are both fans. Everybody I know mm-hmm. who's who's anybody in the cigar industry, even all the other podcasters I know, you are one of the podcasts that we listen to all the time. You guys have the longest-running cigar podcast in the history of the world. You've been doing it more than 10 years now. And tell us, first of all, how you first decided, let's start doing a podcast, and then what is it that drives you to keep doing the podcast and you know continue finding... Uh, new things to talk about. Well, Gianna, well, Gianna here, and I'm smoking. Gianna told me I need to get on social media 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And um, I put a Facebook page up, and she said, oh, you got to interact. You got to do this, and I don't have time to do this. And when somebody answers, you have to do that. I'm running three stores, a mail order operation. I got a lot of things going on, lots of cigar brands, and everything's going on. I said, I can't do that. And I, I got a book on the way to the airport, and uh, about social media to learn about it. And I learned about podcasting. And I'm like, wow, this is a one-way t- type thing. And I can get my uh, thing out there and actually talk to a whole bunch of people. And the idea of the show is to inform, educate, and entertain. And the thing is, I remember I didn't do very well in school. And part of it was that my teachers bored the hell out of me and my mind's going a mile a minute and I'm not even paying attention anymore. And that became what the problem is. And I think people need to be entertained and you sprinkle in some education. There's got to be more this, you know, we're having laughs or whatever and we're throwing some information in there at the same time. Because if it's all just hardcore, hard hitting information, information, that's it. You're going to lose them. What's the attention span of what, what somebody does. So let me entertain, let me entertain, but let me um, educate them and get my message out that I want to tell people that dark cigars are not strong cigars and you need to try these different things. The thing is, when I put the podcast together, I expected people from my area to be the ones listening. They knew me, so they're going to listen to my podcast. That's not what happened. I mean, we were getting people from other countries and we were getting people, people all around the United States and very little was was getting here. Um, so I said, well, it doesn't matter anyway. I, here's what I wanted to try to accomplish. And then some people, believe it or not, they, they come up from another state and come visit the show. They want to come see the show, which is amazing to me and very humbling when they come up. And I'm like, really, you came all the way up here from Arizona to see this? And they say, yeah. And I go, I'm sorry. Can I take you out to lunch or something? <laughs> I, I feel terrible that, you know, that what you see is what you get. That, that's it. And uh, no, no, no. I feel like I know you and all that. So, um, you know, as time went on, we were able to launch brands and help out manufacturers and, um, you know, bring back old things and have connections with somebody that I'm friendly with and be able to bring them in and let other people uh, see who they are and what they're all about. Uh, and at the same time, trying to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, I, it went much further than I thought it would go. I never would have thought 10 years, you know, uh, I thought of it many times and said, uh, can I have my Saturdays back? Um, but um, it continues to go and, and the guys on it and we've switched some guys out here and there as 10 years went on. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's a good group of guys and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. And I, I imagine it's the same for you. I mean, why are you doing this, right? 
we it's it's just an industry that we both are in love with it's the 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 relationships and the people and and you know all the people we smoke with all the people we chat with the people who work at the shops who own the shops the brand owners we've gotten to know the manufacturers we've gotten to know it's just i i i repeat this silly mantra from time to time but it's really true cigar people are the best people and that's mm -hmm. been true in my that's been true in my life is that the uh, out of all the different areas of my life i the the people who have been been johnny on the spot when something when when if i need something if 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 somebody needs me whatever it is the, the it's just a community of people that just seem to be um not to get sappy but they, they seem to be in touch with each other and 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 uh and caring and understanding and at the same time like you said it's a fun group of people it's a fun atmosphere it's it's uh uh great conversations you can talk about anything and still you know still leave the the shop uh, after finishing your cigars um friends and it's it's just a wonderful culture love to be a part of it yeah. if i if i wasn't in the business I would be in the cigar lounge with everybody else. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I've, I've been asked to, to sell out before and uh, I don't want to do it because I said I'll be uh, sitting here and it's better to be the king. And I get to walk <laughs> in the back room if I want to do whatever I want or whatever. But I love it. Uh, I made a decision um, maybe about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I said, um, you know, accountants and things look at your assets and things like this and set you up for your retirement as a self-employed person. I mean, you know, what are you going to end up doing? And you need a 10-year plan. And what do you want to do? And the decision was made then. I said, I'm going to die at the desk. I've made a decision that I'm going to stay forever and ever. And that's it. That's what I'm going to do because I'm happy doing it. Yeah. And I know a lot of people in the cigar business that left. And they were not so happy after they left. They got all the money, but they sold their toy box. Yeah. And this is our toy box. And, you know, if you're a little kid, you don't want money. You sell all your toys and then you got this paper. What are you going to do with it? It's your toys. Well, this is my toy box. I don't want to get rid of it. I love it. And we watched as 90-year-old um, people, Avo Yavazian, 91, stays mm -hmm. in the cigar business till the very end. Um, Newman. Uh, in his 90s, um, Padron. Padron. There's yeah. so many, mm -hmm. and and I and I know all these people. I knew all these people, and I sat with them, and they loved it so much. And they had much more than I had. And I said, "When are you going to stop?" And they taught me. They taught me, do what you love. And yeah. you know, um, people that end up. I got to imagine a lot of people right now that were thinking about retiring after 30 or 40 days stuck at home, they may be a rethinking it right now. Yeah. And maybe they're dying to go to back to work because I, I love to go back to work every single day. I love to go to work and what a unbelievable blessing that is to get up in the morning and can't wait to go to work. I love my family and everything, but I love going to work and I love meeting all the guys. I've made so many friends over so many years. We have customers that have been with us since the very, very beginning. I've been to their weddings. I've seen their children being born. And the same goes for manufacturers and reps that I've grew up with them. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about Klaus Kellner uh, before the show. Um, you know, I remember when he was born and yeah. I remember taking him bowling when he was a little kid and uh, just unbelievable stuff that went along. And uh, we're seeing their kids now come up, you know, oh, the yeah. next generation of them uh, living through the cigar boom of watching a Rocky Patel and a Nick Perdomo come hmm. into the industry. They weren't there before. I watched yeah. them come in and watch them grow so big and become, I'm so proud of them. I'm so happy for them. It's just a wonderful thing watching them, and and they've watched me, and it's, oh, yeah. really great. it's like a family. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is a family. And um, so, how many how many episodes of the podcast after all these years? Uh, I think we're at five twenty five ish. Wow, that's we fantastic. never we, we never missed a show. Haven't missed it. So so every every week you haven't missed a show. Two hours each week. That's incredible. I yeah, love it. We're almost there. It. Yeah, we're all, we're, we're 56. We've only got 10 more years. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think nine. You can, nine. Nine more years. Yeah, nine I, don't, more years. I don't math so good. So what are if you can if you can think of uh bring one just really 
hilarious or 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 heartwarming memory from from episodes of the podcast uh does anything come to mind as a special memory from one episode um you know um i did in a we do an event every father's day father and son cigar dinner Mm. and it's been going on for about 10 years now um maybe nine years i think nine years and the first year i had nick and nicholas perdomo come do the podcast and after that we had a cigar dinner and we had maybe 50 people and every person was a father and son that was there and the reason why i started this is my dad and i i talked to you early my dad wasn't even a cigar smoker and he used to come see me on sundays and he'd say grab me a cigar i'll have a cigar with you he wasn't a cigar smoker and i'd grab him a cigar and then He'd say, ah, I didn't like it. And then I'd get a different cigar and a different cigar. And as I tell you, I try to do with customers. I was trying to do so much for my dad. And oh, finally, yeah. we, we had a cigar dinner. And um, it was a Griffin cigar <laughs> that Griffin had made a cigar only for Europe. Uh, the Dawn, the Griffin Dawn, I can't remember the last name of it. But whatever this big size Griffin was, and I, st- I still have a few of them. Um, the mistake was that they sent in it to U.S. and they called me up and they said, we got 30 bucks of these things. Instead of sending them back, any chance you want them? And I said, oh, I could do something with them. I'll do a cigar dinner with them and it'll be something that's not available here. So I did it. He was there. He smoked it. He said, now this is a good cigar. I love this cigar. <laughs> so I grabbed every single one that was left and I said, okay, these are for my father. He comes up and every Sunday we're going to smoke a cigar together. And every Sunday... We smoked the cigar, and not realizing uh, years later, uh, we had our last cigar not knowing, and he died of an aneurysm in the store. His aorta aneurysm blew. He fell to the ground. What's the matter, Dad? Oh, I don't know. I just got so dizzy, closed his eyes, and he died. Hmm. Fast forward, the next week comes up, and he's not there anymore, and you don't even realize what had been going on it was going on every single week but i don't realize till it till it ended up stopping so i put that together because i wanted to um let everybody understand i didn't know it was happening when it was going on and sit down and have a smoke with your dad or have a smoke with your son and you know you'll never forget it because it it wasn't about anything else but sit there and you have a different type of conversation when you're having a cigar with somebody It's it's a whole different world and I brought Nick up there and I explained to him on the show, this is what, why this show is all, that show and that day was all about. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, as even talking about it, it, it gets me. Oh, you yeah. Know, yep. it, just unbelievable what happened. And I had said to my dad that last time he had come up, I opened the drawer and looked in and there were five cigars left. And I said, hey, Dad, there's only five cigars left, one for me, one for you. I said, what are you going to do after these cigars are gone? He said, I'll never smoke another cigar again. And he never did. That was it. Because he died and that was it. And I said, Mm -hmm. listen, we got to do this. And um, Nick was happy to do the the first show with me. And every single year we have a different father and son. We've never repeated. And it's somebody in the cigar industry with their son or their father. And it's been unbelievable stuff uh, over the years that have happened. And this year, Nick Perdomo is coming back for the first time uh, with his son, who's now in the industry and actually Mm -hmm. did our first podcast with us ever nine years ago. That day was the first time he was ever interviewed in his life. He was scared to death, the poor kid. Mm -hmm. But we had him on uh, just last week and talking to him again after after nine years had passed. We'll bring him on. But that was a... Uh, a personal, very touching time that happened. Oh, yeah. Show. And, um, you know, it, it's usually about the other person that happened. But at that moment, uh, just explaining the story was like, oh, my God, I'm thinking of them. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, 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 it's it's not a cigarette. It's not a chewing tobacco. It's a whole different thing. And the government mm-hmm. needs to understand that. And people need to understand that this is much more than rolled up tobacco leaves. It's this. Yeah, You know, and we yeah. see it in our cigar lounges all the time. We see what the friends we make. People have have 
come to my store, met somebody, and later on, that guy's the best man at his wedding. They met in the store. Yeah. You know, they, they become the godfather of their children. They become best friends and, and travel with them, and their families get together, and these things have happened. And I've, I've heard this at, at funerals and weddings and everything. You, you, you hear the stories of what a cigar shop does, and th that should be part of this. You know, it, my God, it, you're able to pull this off um, virtually. You know, nothing like, though, if we could be together. Yeah. You know, yeah. this, is, this is social media. Social, oh, yeah. talking so, yeah. with each other. And, yeah. you know, I, when I bring politicians in the store that are looking to collect money and they say, oh, I'm running for office. And I said, I'm going to give you the money, but you got to come down and get it. And they can, can you just send it in the mail? I said, I'll make it worth your while, but you got to come down. And I take <laughs> them down and I take them in the lounge and I introduce them to the guys and say, he's one of us. He's for us and he's never going to hurt us, even though he never said that. I say that in front of every single one of them. And I say, you're going to take care of us, right? going to make sure that nobody does it. No, no, no. That's it. And all the guys end up talking to him. And he says, wow, I'm glad I came because this is not what I thought it was. I yeah. said, what did you think it was? And he said, I don't know. I didn't think it was this. So <laughs> yeah. pe people need to see what this is. Sometimes there's no windows. People can't see inside what it is. They need to come inside to see what this is. And I think at that point, they may, they're not going to get hooked on the cigar. It's not the cigar. You get hooked on this. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Well, I got to tell you, Dave, you got me fired up earlier with the with the the legislative conversation, and now you got me emotional with this conversation. I'm not I'm, crying. I, I'm not <laughs> crying. You're crying. There's no crying in cigars. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that was that's a, I I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. That's that's really meaningful. I I appreciate that. Um, so, um, oh, I had one more. Okay, so. And there's some other viewer questions I want to ask too, but this is the last one I had on my list here. So take all these hats that we've just talked about. Um, and actually know that I'm going to, I lied. There's one more before this. So you're also an author. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> so you're a published author. Yeah. David versus Goliath. So tell us what the inspiration was for the book and you know, um, where all the ideas came from that, uh, you know, that you put into this book and, and why it is that you wanted to share it with, with the world. Well, it, it always comes down to the same thing. I am a brick and mortar guy. Uh, I love brick and mortar. I love brick and mortar people. Um, and, um, I want to help brick and mortar retailers all the time, uh, especially cigar retailers. And, um, the idea was, to put a book out for all retail. It's not necessarily, actually, if you look in the book, it doesn't mention cigars in there. It says, here's, here's an idea for a bakery. Here's an idea for a hairdresser. Here's an idea. Honestly, every single one of those ideas were done at Two Guys Smoke Shop because that's the business I'm in for 35 years. I'm not a hairdresser and I'm not a baker. So where did they come from? But I Wait, put you're not there. a hairdresser? I Are am not. Sure? I know it's hot though. You, you look at this and... <laughs> Watch the Cigar Authority this week. Oh, all right. Here's the tease. Uh, there you, you go. Like you want to see if I'm like a hairdresser? Watch at at the one o'clock. Uh, yeah, I think the one o'clock hour. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna see. I'll, I'll I'll let you in on it right now. So the hairdresser, hair, um, barbers and stuff are all closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh, I'm gonna oh, come. Me. That's why we're wearing hats. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> so my hair my hair has gone way too far. And um, I will cut my own hair on the show at commercial break. At commercial break. Oh, I love it. I love it. So, I can't wait. For the people that watch the show, and, and it's an audio show, but you can watch it on YouTube and Facebook yeah. and stuff, I'll, I'll cut my own hair, and uh, we'll see at the end of the – I only get uh, four minutes because that's how long the commercial yeah. break is, four minutes, and I got four minutes to do what I can do, and uh, I'm going to do it. So I love it. I can't, I can't wait. wait. So what was the question? So sorry, I, de I derailed you. Just, uh, you know, the ideas, uh, you know, that you put in the book and, you know, oh, where yeah. the ideas came from and why you decided to share it. Yeah. So I've always shared all the promotions and events and things I do. I invite my competitors to come to our events. Um, by all means, uh, take what I have done right and make it your own and make it better if you can possibly do it. 
Um, a lot of them are very original ideas. Some are old-fashioned, old ideas that came from 100 years ago, and I turned it into, into my own. Uh, but take them and improve your business because the thing about brick and mortar, I want brick and mortar to last, and brick and mortar has to be exceptional. It has to be exceptional customer service, and it has to be an experience. And it doesn't, you know, I do these wild promotions where I give away maybe a Rolls Royce, Hummers, motorcycles, and all kinds of stuff, and they say, well, I can't do that. Well, can you give away 50 cents? Can you give away a deck of cards? Can you give away uh, a box of cereal? You know, my anniversary parties that, that are so popular that uh, this year we're giving away $35,000. My first year doing it was our eighth anniversary. The, the first prize was a box of cereal. It was a box of Wheaties cereal. Huh. And on the box of Wheaties cereal was Red Auerbach. Red Auerbach was a cigar smoker. Oh, the, wow, yeah. The, the Celtics coach, yeah, ha who happened to be a customer. So I made a deal with Red Auerbach that this event was going to go on. He was going to come in, and he was going to sign the box of cigars and say something to the group, which he did, and that was the prize. Somebody won a box of cereal, but I sold all the tickets to the event saying that it was a box of cereal. That was the prize. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be something crazy, but it has to be something. And the drawer of... Buy three, get one free. The rep is coming in the store, and he's going to give you a free hat and stuff. It's been done. It's been redone. It's old. It's, it's, it's over. And it was never really an event anyway. Giving away 33% of your product is, is not an event, a promotional event. It's actually a tragedy. Can you come up with events? And, and you know, maybe my mind works a little different because I was in the nightclub business and part of it was promotions that I had to do in nightclubs to, to get hundreds and hundreds of people to show up at a certain hour on a certain day for the promotion. So however my mind worked, I did these things over the course of years. And that even goes to when cigar manufacturers would show up in cigar stores. I started that. I asked the manufacturer to show up to, to come in the store, and they're like, what are you, out of your mind? We don't do that. And I said, I think it's going to work out pretty good. And now the friggin' road shows that go on over here. So I want to help the brick-and-mortar retailer get creative, come up with interesting things to help grow their business, and at the end of it, make the customer happy too. So little, little things. So I put all these in a book, and I'll tell you, some people told me as I was doing this, Wow, you're giving away all your trade secrets. I said, they can have it all. They can have everything, and, and I got much more. What I don't want them to do is the stuff I did wrong, because I could write an encyclopedia of Botanica of the mistakes I made along the way. There's a, there's a one for you, is the mistakes. But this is 100 proven promotions for any brick-and-mortar retailer of any kind of little things to do that I guarantee them they get back 10 times that on the first promotion that they do inside the book. So if they end up doing incorporating this stuff in, they can thrive and they can beat the online giant. And in some cases, the online giant is Amazon. And in other cases, it's, it's some of our suppliers and giant online um, discounters and things like that. But whatever it is, especially after this is over, when this crisis is over that we're in right now, you better not be doing it the same way you did before. Just like we talked about the tobacco manufacturer making cigars hundreds of years ago. This is the way we used to do it. You can't do it the way you used to do it because history just changed. Something just happened. What is the answer to do? I don't know that answer right now, but I'm going to try to figure it out. And I only have a short period of time to do that. So some mistakes are going to happen and some right things are going to happen. But retailers, you got to step up. You yeah. got to do it. I'm asking the, the consumer, please buy from the retailer. But at the same time, retailer, don't sit back and just expect it to come to you. You got to put something out there. Give them something. Yeah. No, that's, I love it. And uh, it's, it's like you said earlier with the, the legislative thing. If you're going to do it anyway, you're going to fight the fight anyway. And if, if people want to join you, that's great. And you're going to you're going to continue to do it anyway. And they people lose sight of the fact that even even though you're technically competitors, you know, with with other cigar shops, with other brick and mortar cigar shops, even though you're competitors, you have to. You you have to play the same game together you should because the, the only person left to talk to the only people that really understand what i go through is another brick and mortar retailer who doesn't want to talk to me 
who thinks I want something out of them. I want nothing but to help them. And if they take the same approach and do nothing but want to help me, what a beautiful world it's going to be. It happens in the restaurant businesses. A restaurant owner goes to visit the other restaurant, how, how it works. And why in the cigar industry do people feel like, oh, my God, I got to hold on to this, and I can't let anybody see what I'm doing and all this stuff. Anybody, any retailer, I'm putting the invite over here, wants to come into Two Guys Smoke Shop and let me take you to all three of our stores, show you behind the scenes and tell you what worked for me. I am not just happy to do it. I would be elated to help you. It yeah. would make me happy to do it because I believe there is good karma that ends up happening. I'm a blessed guy, man. I don't, I don't need much anymore. I, I did what I had to do. I'm staying in it forever anyway, but I don't need from anybody. So yeah. I'm happy to help them because nice things have happened back to me. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I want to pull Chad's question up on the screen here. What's one mistake you can tell us about? So you put all the successes in the book. And like you said, uh, the, it'll be another book uh, with all the mistakes. What's uh, if, you, if you can name one promotion that you tried that just didn't work? Ah, so La Giana's made in, uh, by Davidoff in Honduras. I made another cigar brand in, in Honduras years ago. And uh, I thought I'd be cute because I tried to answer the question of what customers come in and ask for. And my answer, I would have the answer for them as soon as they come in, that this would be there. So the most asked for thing, if you ask any retailer is, do you have any Cubans? <laughs> so I made a brand called Any Cubans, Any Cubans. So the people would come in and say, do you have any Cubans? And I would say, yes, I do. <laughs> and I would walk them over and it would say any Cuban. And the guy would look at me and go, really? And I go, any Cuban? And they didn't find it funny. It didn't sell well. And that was the end of that. <laughs> and when, when you go into production on something, you know, it, it's not give me 10 boxes. It's hundreds of boxes mm -hmm. per size. And mm -hmm. I went deep. And it, it took many, many years to get rid of these at less than I paid for. Them. I was going to stay. I, I was going to say, are you still smoking those? <laughs> yeah, it was a long time. But listen, there's a million of them. But there's one just because I happen to be smoking. Uh, uh, and, and that was a great cigar. It was just marketed terribly. But I thought it was pretty cute. But nobody I else got it. I think <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. It but I can see where, a, where customer after customer would look at you and say, are you serious right now? <laughs> yeah, it happened all day long. <laughs> well, I uh, I just want to give a quick update on the uh, La Giana. And it was a wonderful cigar. Probably one. So I'm not a retrohaler uh, very often. Uh, Matt does a lot more than I do. But the retrohale on that was delicious. It was smooth and fantastic. So um, then... I uh, I just lit up the firecracker. Uh, the and opposite of that. It is a <laughs> firecracker. It that, is certainly. You went from one extreme to the other on I that. that those are the did, two man. extremes of, of our lines for sure. And uh, it, it is delicious. Um, another uh, viewer question um, that we had was uh, you have, uh, what was it? Hypothetical question. Uh, tomorrow's your last day on earth. You got time for one cigar. What are you grabbing? It Great is question. it is Atabay. And Atabay is from Nelson Alfonso. Um, the story of that is uh, Rocky Patel told me, hey, did you look at those cigars in the other room over there? It was at one of the trade shows behind a curtain. And I said, no. And he says, you of all people have to try the cigar. And I went over there and I said, uh, wow, this is so beautiful. Well, what are these cigars? And he says, oh, they're made in Costa Rica and blah, 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 blah. Would you like to try one? I said, yeah. And uh, I cut the cigar, put it in my mouth, and I said, what are these retail for? He said, between $20 and $30. I said, wow. And everybody that was around me at that moment left. <laughs> and, I, and I looked at him, and I said, I am so sorry. And he said, well, somebody had to ask the question. And I said, listen, I got a meeting right now with somebody else. I'll be back as soon as I finish this, I'm going to come back. I lit the cigar and I walked away. I barely remember the meeting that I had with the other person because I was smoking that cigar. I couldn't believe what I had smoked. I smoked everything. And mm -hmm. 
people ask me for years and years, what's your favorite cigar? And I say, oh, it depends what time of day and, you know, what, what you're around and all this stuff. And it, it does. A lot of that has to do with mm -hmm. it. With the exception of that cigar, there's something different about that cigar that I have never smoked before. What is that? I have no idea what it is. But, wow, what a cigar. And I've shared that with a lot of cigar manufacturers. Take the band off it, let them try the cigar, and they go, wow, what is that? Because nobody can pinpoint what's going on with that cigar. We're talking about major aging, different type of tobaccos that are in it, um, different cedar woods that happen. There's no cigar that's like it, with the exception of Byron, which is a little more full-bodied than that. So I like the Atabay better. I, I wouldn't say it's a very mild cigar. I'd say maybe it's a medium-bodied cigar. But you take a, a Byron, and some of them can get up there in strength. Very good, but Atabay, phew, what, what a cigar that is. Yeah. No, no cheap date for sure, but <laughs> if, if, if there was one, that's the one for me. Yeah. Did you go back and make an order? I did. I went back and I said, I want to order them for all three stores. What do I have to order? And the guy said, um, if you order for all three stores, I'll give you the exclusive for New Hampshire. And I said, you know who I am? And he said, yeah, I know who you are because I didn't know who he was. And I said, I don't want an exclusive for anything. Uh, and that's another thing. I don't ever want the exclusivity of anything. I want everybody to be able to get every, every, anything they can. I don't want to win a customer because he can't get it from my competitor. I want to get the, uh, the customer to come into me because I operate better than my competitor because it's a better experience yeah. at my store, and that's the way I end up playing. It's never been that game, but I know a lot of uh, retailers do it. I, I think it's a lousy way of doing it, and, it, and it's a disservice to the cigar brand. I wear a lot of different hats, like you said. And the reason why I wear a lot of different hats is I want to understand everything. You as media, I want to understand you as media, and I do. And I understand somebody else is a retailer, somebody else is an online guy, somebody else is a manufacturer. I do it all so I can understand it. Not that I can succeed in every single part of it the, the same way I do as brick and mortar, but so I can understand it. And it's a disservice for any retailer to say to the shop, the um, manufacturer that I don't want you to sell to the guy down the street because the fact of the matter is his competitor is one inch away from the other one. You right. take that cigar and one inch away is the other guy's brand and you're going to tell him he can't open the guy 10 miles down the street? Yeah. It's just It's just not a fair thing to do and I wouldn't want it to happen to me on the wholesaling end of it and I don't want it to I wouldn't do it to somebody on the retail end. Everybody should put everybody else's hat on when they when they take a, take an action against somebody else. Yeah. Mm. So if you had to choose, so take the retail operation, take the the brands that you're a part of, take the podcast, take the book, take the legislative action. If you had to choose, if you were forced to choose, you're only allowed to do one of those things for the rest of your life. I know it's a tough choice, but if you had to choose one of those, which one would you choose? It's not a tough choice. It's brick and mortar. That's what I am. That's what's in my heart. That's what I want to do. That's where I go every single day. To be honest with you, on the online presence that we end up having, I've never taken an online call. I've never processed. I've been doing online since, my God, 90, maybe 93. We started online. Never took an online call. Never uh, processed the order. It's a faceless transaction. It, it, it's not good to me. Um, as, as far as it goes with um, the podcast, um, it's missing something. It's missing this, and you're, you're taking some. You're, you're able to take some questions and things like this. But I like it better that me and you are talking together. So it's a, it's a two way conversation, which which we which what we have when it comes to um, brick and mortar face to face transactions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, th this is where cigar brands are built. This is where they're born. There's no cigar brands that make it online and end up going to, to brick and mortar stores. It works the other way around. This is where this thing is born. This is where the whole culture happens. This is what, what the whole thing of it. That's why I beg the people that listen here, support your local brick and mortar store. Yes. It, when it, you're going to know when it's gone. Like when my father passed away, I knew it when he was gone. You're going to know when it's gone. And then you're going to say, oh, shit. What happened? Yep, that's right. I loved going to that place. Well, you have to support it so it can stay in existence. Yeah, absolutely.
Um, so let's uh, let's move into this week's smokabulary word. Mm-hmm. And guys, as always, smokabulary is brought to you by AJ Fernandez. Born and raised in Cuba, AJ Fernandez now produces unparalleled premium cigars in Esteli, Nicaragua. The day-to-day operations at Tabacalera AJ Fernandez are managed under the watchful eye of Mr. Fernandez himself in order to ensure superior quality. The AJ Fernandez portfolio of premium cigars provides blend, strength, and flavor profiles to match the preferences of any premium cigar consumer. Whether it's New World, Dias de Gloria, San Latano, Enclave, or Bayas Artes, you are sure to be satisfied with a premium cigar from AJ Fernandez. So, guys, this week's vocabulary word is purge. Like the horror movie? Like the horror movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Except not like the horror movie. Oh, not like the horror movie. <laughs> so, Dave, when I say the word purge, as the cigar smoker, when I say the word purge, what do you think of? I just purged. Throwing up? Oh no! <laughs> so, so a uh, purge is blow when you blows when you bl- blow out of the cigar instead of draw through the cigar. Ah, oh, so okay. yeah. It, and it's not it's not super common, but it's something that I've heard from over the years. I've heard from different people saying that uh sometimes if if you pick the cigar up off the ashtray and you start to puff on it and it's barely and it's still barely lit sometimes if you purge if you blow through the cigar a little bit it'll help to heat that cherry up and and you and you maybe won't have to bring the lighter back to the cigar again uh but i've also heard from some people and i haven't had this experience myself but i have heard from some people that it can if you if you have issues with a cigar that's starting to taste kind of harsh yep or if bitter. you blow through mm-hmm. the cigar it can help dissipate some of that uh, that hasn't been my experience but it has hey, been mine if it, if it works for you i say do it yeah no it oh. works if if you're getting a lot of bitterness especially at the end and you do a good you know i just purged so it it won't look like you could purge yours right now yeah so if i just blow out of the cigar instead of draw in it it changes the flavor of the cigar so whether it's bitter or not try and purge every once in a while and um and then uh puff on it again it's well you guys have a have a cigar and you get called in the house or something you put the cigar down you called in the house totally forgot about the cigar maybe eight hours later you go back here's your cigar you left it's three quarters of the way still good and you say oh my god i forgot about that cigar when you relight the cigar a lot of times they end up tasting really lousy after yep well if you take all the ash off it now you toast the cigar up and instead of drawing the smoke in you blow out purge Yep. Mm -hmm. yep and continue to light it as you're blowing out blowing out blowing out and the next hit you take of that cigar, it's perfectly clear all the way through. And it tastes as good as it did when yep. you left it. Especially if you purge before you put the cigar down. Let's say you're not going to forget, you know, and, and you know, hey, I got to run in and do a few things in the house. If you purge before putting it down and go and do what you got to do and come back, you'll have a, a much, you know, closer experience. Yeah. Okay. So now it is time for... Numero de los muertos. <laughs> and as always, Numero de los muertos is brought to you by Oveja Negra. Oveja Negra Brands brings you premium smoking experiences forged from tobacco, time, and talent. Comprised of Black Label Trading Company, Black Work Studio, Dissident, and Emilio. And Emilio. Oveja Negra Brands provides smokers uncompromising blends renowned for their flavor and lasting impression. Oveja Negra, where art and tobacco collide. Join the flock. Visit ovejanegracigars.com to learn more. All right, guys. All right. What, what's the number this week? Well, since 1955, the average of this global number has been unchanged. It is 10 a year globally. Exactly 10 per year. Is the average the average since 1955? Yep. And is were there none before 1955, or did they just not keep stats? There really wasn't much before 1955. Okay, he doesn't want to give it away. So, Dave, we have to guess that uh, since 1955, an average of 10 people a year 
around the world have died from this mystery cause. Mm. Ten, only 10 people in the world. Yeah, that's yeah. not many at all. Yeah. Struck uh, by lightning? Am I supposed to guess? Yeah, yeah guess, yeah, ask, guess yes away. Or no. And our viewers, Question. as always, our viewers, please leave your guesses in the comments. We'll throw them up on screen. And it's not lightning. Uh, is it related to any kind of disease? It is not. Not disease. Um, is it... Uh, these are humans, right? Not not animals or... Aliens, no. Aliens. Yeah. <laughs> How do you um, find this information out? Oh, he, he I dig. He researches. Dig. Uh, yeah, I dig. Uh, it, Chad says dolphin attacks. No, but Not, that would be frightening. That would be frightening. I thought Only dolphins were, were nice. Very small. Uh, Not cars. Car tires exploding while changing a tire. No. Nope. Not sharks. Not plane, sharks. Plane crashes. No. Oh. It wouldn't uh, be like that wouldn't count as one. That would be all the people that died. Right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is it caused by uh, like animal bites or animal attacks? No, no. Um, oh, here's a good. Ooh, trees falling. It is not trees falling. Not trees. Okay. Is so it? So this is here's a here's the first hint. Okay. It's an activity. Activity. And this is global. It's not global. just the United States. Correct. Hit by a baseball. Uh, actually, I did that one. Yeah, we did that oh, one. Oh, my. And in professional baseball, there's only been one death. Yep. Hit by pitch. Uh, it is not sextuplets being born. <laughs> That's a good guess. but That no. is. <laughs> it's a frightening I mean, guess. Yeah. But <laughs> it's getting but they, would all, they would have to die. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so is it? Activity. It's an activity. Is it? Mm -hmm. Is it? Is this activity... Uh, activity that's that is commonly done professionally, or is it just a recreational activity? Well, there's both. There's both. I would say uh, it's more popular recreationally than there is professional. Is it getting? Is it walking in front of a javelin when somebody throws it and getting hit by a javelin? That's awesome. No. <laughs> oh, I wish it was that. Not or, parasailing. Not parasailing. We're kind of getting closer. Skydiving? Oh. I did that one. Yeah, we uh, did skydiving a few weeks ago. I got to listen to the show more often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, golf carts. Crashing I golf carts. That it. is an awesome guess. That is I a love good that. Guess. Alan Gold. <laughs> it is vertigo, not. Vertigo Litus. Uh, oh, yeah. Vertigo? Yeah. Thanks for watching, Alan. We yeah. appreciate it. Uh, it is not cliff diving. Not, oh, I didn't see. Cl oh, yeah. Cliff diving. That's a great guess. Oh, oh struck, struck by, by lightning. lightning. Playing golf? It, nope. No. Cliff diving? No. Um, so uh, is it... Uh, um, here's, a, here's a hint. It has never happened in Minnesota. Well, there's a lot of things that have never happened in Minnesota. Um, it's Is it... Uh, what do you call it The when, when somebody walks out on the wing of the plane while they're doing acrobatics oh, yeah. in the air. Uh, I don't know yeah. what you call that. Yeah, that's not it's it. It's not that. No. <laughs> not that. Oh. No, uh, they, they do have... Um... <laughs> Vikings won the Super... I love that you said... I know Super Noel was a, was a typo, but it's perfect. Super Noel, because that yeah, if the Vikings ever win, it'll yeah, it's an that's a no. I hate you guys. <laughs> um, uh, it's never happened in Minnesota. Uh, it's when somebody said uh, hang gliding or uh, parasailing. Parasailing. You said okay. So is is this activity take place on or in the water? Yes. Um. Uh, is it the scuba diving where they have those motorized things they Ooh. hold on to? To no, no. Is it scuba diving? It is not. That's a really good guess. Water skiing is is incorrect. Water skiing, no. Sailboating is incorrect. These are all good guesses. Great guesses. 
Um, think of, uh, you know, the, and, and there are professionals who do those things. So, you know, again, think of, um, uh, events where they have professional competitions, but is also uh, a really popular sport as a recreation. Jet skiing, jet skiing. No. Is it jet? Is it power boats? No racing. Mm -mm. No fishing. Is it fishing? It is not Paul fishing. Says. Oh, that's a, another really Great good guess. guess. I'm running out of water activity. And yeah. that's weird because there's a lot of water activities in Minnesota. I know. And but, nobody uh, died from it in Minnesota. This but month. think of the difference between the water here in Minnesota and maybe somewhere else. Surfing? It is surfing. It's surfing. Surfing. And here's... so Man, here's that, was the, a, that was a tough one. Here's the interesting part about surfing. Um, so if a surfer is... Um, uh, attacked by a shark, it's not considered a surfing accident. It's a shark attack. So if they're okay. surfing and because technically, you know, um, you could have been swimming and yeah. still getting eaten by the shark. Um, so they're but, drowning. So it's either drowning, you know, in a, they get uh, tangled up in a reef or, or yeah. something else or um, take a really bad spill uh, 10 years. So, um, most of that statistic actually comes from Australia. Well, yeah, there's a lot of surfing in Australia. Yeah. Or if you're uh, Greg Brady. Or Greg Brady. Yeah. yeah. Remember the Brady Bunch episode with I, the surfing? I do. Um, okay. So, Dave, here are some completely off the wall, completely non cigar related questions. Uh, I'm not going to do well here. If you could choose to hear the thoughts of one living person for 10 minutes, who would it be and why? Donald Trump. <laughs> that is the most popular answer. Hey, get out of here. I mean, yeah, I got to yeah. listen to the show more often. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most. There are so many people that have said that's they want to hear what's going on inside his head. So was that no good? I got to pick somebody else. No, Ooh. that's a great answer. That's All perfect. Right. Yeah, that's perfect. So if you were about to get into a fight, what soundtrack music would come on? We are the champions. Ooh. Oh, I like that. That's never. That's never. Time. All right, good. That's good. a great one. That is good. Um, Little queen. So choose one of the following. You could hit a home run as a starting pitcher. You could score a touchdown as a defensive lineman. You could score a hockey goal as the goalie, or you could score a soccer goal. Coast to coast as the goalie. Uh, starting pitcher, home run. Yeah, that's good. It, that's that's very popular answer. I think the most popular is hockey. It's definitely hockey. But uh, yeah, it, hitting a home run as a pitcher is like, you know, it's how many times was that done? Oh, hard. Very very few in history. Very few. I don't know. I I, I should actually have that stat available actually. But For average of three a year, you can use that. Yeah, there you go. I'll take it. Well, <laughs> Bert Blylevin has three to his name, and yeah. he, he talks about it multiple times. Yes, he brings it up at least <laughs> once a game when he's broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love Bert. Yeah, we do. Um, so uh, kind of back on cigar questions, but more more quick hitters. If you could give one piece of advice to a brand new premium cigar consumer, what would it be? Um, don't be afraid to try cigars you think you're not going to like. Because they tend to go to the mild, light, sweet, and then years later they finally find that they like something totally different. But it's a tough one. It's a tough one to get them to do it. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true, but I agree. It's important. It is. Um, same question, but, and and you've given... You've given so much advice in your book and on your podcast to brick and mortar cigar retailers, you know, free advice. But out of out of your book, let's say, if you had to pick one of those gold nuggets of advice from your book to give to another premium cigar retailer, brick and mortar retailer, what would it be the most important? It's kind of a long story that's in there, but basically it says answer the phone. In other words, ring the door knocks, answer at the opportunity, 
Opportunity Knocks answered the door. It's mm-hmm. a long story that's in there. I think I went two pages to tell the story of, of the man that ex- explained this to me and how rich he got from doing it. And the thing was to answer the phone, you know, th- these, especially contractors and things like that, that uh, they, they have nobody answering the phone for them. You know, we answer the phone on the first ring. We try to do it every single time. And when somebody ends up saying, I want to do a cigar event at a restaurant or whatever, I take their call. I listen to what it is because sometimes it's something, you know, I, I don't want to do those things typically, but I listen to hear what it says. And then sometimes it's like the opportunity of a lifetime. So yeah. opportunity knocks. You got to you got to be there for it. Yeah. Well, and you also here's an opportunity is right now of what, what is happening now. Yeah, what is going right. to happen after that? As bad as it is, there's an opportunity there. I don't know what it is, yep. but pay attention to look around, pay attention, because maybe one time in our whole life, we're going to have that opportunity, whatever that is. And it's yeah. right now. Well, and also, you never know, even if, you, let's say, like you said, you take the call, somebody wants to do some certain type of event, but it's not the right event for you. That's fine, because you still, who knows what is going to end up becoming of that relationship, even though you don't, something else will come out of it. Right. And you may have just blown that opportunity if you don't, like you said, just take the call. Yeah, they won't even take the call, some of them, yeah. 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 So, and, and kind of a final piece on the legislative end, if you had one, and, and I know you, you're really active with, with uh, so many of these organizations, but if you could give one piece of advice to the PCA, what would it Boy, be? I'm doing a lot of it. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm talking with them uh, coming up uh, next week or something, doing another thing to the PCA. Um, you know, I don't know if they're going to have a trade show this year or whatever, but um, they can't make... Um, giant decisions without part of their problem is communication, lack of communication. I sat on the board for three years, took a year off, came back, did another three years, worked hard as I could. I couldn't believe they had me back after the first three years because this is how I am, right? And, I, and the, the pushback was unbelievable. But they they have poor communication. And th- there was a big fight to even have communication happened within the trade show. I was the guy that ended up fighting to make it so bloggers and stuff could come to the trade show. They were against it. I said, it's free advertising. It's good. Get the word out about the organization. And I think it played out fantastically well. But for some reason, there's people there that are against communication and they want to hold it back. The best thing to do is let it all out. Tell everybody what you're thinking because maybe somebody's going to stop you before you make the bad mistake. I do it to my staff all the time. I say, I got this idea. I'm going to do this, this, this. And sometimes they stop me and say, oh, my God, you can't do that. I got this idea from when this thing is over that's going to be a big promotion that was going to drive hundreds and hundreds of people to come to Two Guys Smoke Shop. And they said, you don't want to do that. And I said, why would I not want to do that? And they said, because everybody's going to be looking for large amounts of crowds of people, which is going to be a very negative thing. And this thing is going to draw a lot of people, and you don't want to do it. And I said, you know something? You're right. Because I was never in this situation. I've always tried to get lots of people. And I came up with an unbelievable idea to get lots and lots of people to come. And they said, you don't want to do this. And I said, thank God that I verbalized this with people. I don't care if somebody steals the idea or whatever it is. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to do it and I'll try to do it better than anybody would do it. But I, I have to say it. And, and that's what I'm worried about with a lot of these organizations. Uh, I've sat on them that everything is hush, hush and don't say anything. And I say, you should say everything, say everything that we're thinking about and let somebody come up with, here's the reasons why not to do it or yeah, do that, but do it this way and it'll be yeah. better instead of a small little group. Let it out there and we can make it better. Yeah. So I got to go back here really quick. Paul says that Garrett and I need to take off our hats and show our quarantine haircuts. So we will do that and be prepared. It's it's ugly. So Garrett's got... I look like um, <laughs> it's, Hitler it's not Youth. Good. I'm just going to say it's not it. A, it's and, not a good look. Well, he, Garrett's yeah. wife is a hairstylist, so he can get... He can get haircuts. I can't get haircuts, so I got this mad afro cooking right now. So that's my... Uh, we're pretty. Yeah, we're pretty. What can I say? That's, uh, you know, it's quarantine time. I'm just going to let it go. I did shave off my beard, and most people don't <laughs> Most people don't even recognize me without the beard. And if they do recognize me, they say, grow the beard back right now, please. <laughs> Except my wife. My wife likes me better without the beard. So, 
you know, what are you going to do? And it's her birthday. And, and yeah, it was her birthday. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, kind of a follow up, kind of a follow up to you, Dave, is uh, um, with uh, Glenn Loop leaving the CRA. Where do you think that leaves the CRA? Well, supposedly they don't have anybody lined up or anything, and, that, and that's a scary thing of, of not having the successor. In all this time, not a successor has been planned anyway. You know, they should be, he should have been training his successor the day he started of having that guy ready to go. Um, so that, that's interesting. I, I, I talked to Glenn, and we had a meeting about CRA with a bunch of other retailers to try to help out that organization that was already pre-planned. But the good news is he's still on board. He still attended the meeting and was mm -hmm. uh, uh, really working hard at some of the thoughts that we had to it. So he's still on board as it is, but they better look for somebody uh, and they better come up with some um, different things to do because uh, it's never been highly successful for the consumer. Um, it's a consumer-driven thing is what it's supposed to be, but the consumer enjoys their cigar and they don't want to deal with the politics of what That's it is. Right. Yeah. So, this, you know, I had said to him there's, there's ways around that. You know, again, I'm doing education on my podcast. They're not coming on for the education. They're coming because we're horsing around, but they're getting it whether they know it or not. Right. So here it is. The same thing's got to end up happening. Let's get people to join CRA. Whether they know it or not, that's what's happening, and we can incorporate it in there. So uh, me, along with a, a few great retailers, got together in, in a great manufacturer, got together with them this week, came up with some ideas. We have another meeting on Friday. Uh, they're going to look at what we had to say and try to put some package together, which was a, a great thing for Glenn to say that he's still working. Uh, I'll tell you, he is still working hard right there, but they need to find uh, another person. What I'll say great about Glenn is he is a great spokesman for the industry. Yes. Um, his, his way, his presence mm -hmm. that he has, he knows the politicians and he knows how politics works and he's going to be missed. Yeah. Well, we'll be following that definitely uh, to see how that uh, progresses. Uh, I want to thank Alan uh, Gold too. Thank you so much for giving us the stats on home runs by pitcher. Uh, Wes Farrell, 37 career home runs and nine in 1931, uh, which, uh, you know, nine in a year, in a season is phenomenal, especially for a pitcher. Uh, and then Bob, Bob Lemon and Warren Spahn uh, oh, wow. with 35 each. So thank you, Alan, for that. I appreciate that very much. But we don't um, have numbers like that anymore. I mean, no, not the, anymore. Those not are in anymore. the 30s and yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about this week's notable smokables. Um, so mm. I'm going to start with um, one that I smoked uh, just a few days. Well, no, it was last week sometime, actually, now that I'm remembering. But the Superfly by oh, Oscar, yeah. Oscar Valladeras um, with the uh, that that funky looking purple purple and black band on there with the, the, the wrapper that is so toothy. I mean, the wrapper looks like 40 grit sandpaper. It's just beautiful. And it's a great little, great little petite Corona or Corona Gorda rather. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, my first one this week. Did it go? Waka, waka. It did. It went waka, waka, and it played disco music. Yeah. When you pull it out, <laughs> uh, Dave, what's something you smoked this past week? Uh, that was, uh, either something from a blast for the past or, or something brand new. I smoked Aladino Maduro, box press Maduro, because it was mentioned on the show last week. And I said, I haven't smoked that cigar since it came out. And I, I'm a regular on Aladino, and I like it very much. But here I am doing the same thing I tell the customers not to do. And I said, my God, I haven't smoked that cigar in the longest time because I love regular Aladino so much, and I don't go to this. And I went to it, and it was fantastic, as I expected anyway. But it's just so funny how uh, something gets out of mind because you like yeah. the other thing that they make. Absolutely. Uh, what was one for you, Garrett? So I got to, you know, we don't, we don't talk Cubans much on the show, but I enjoyed my very first Cohiba Maduro. Mm, I haven't, I've still never had one of those, but I've heard good things. Did you enjoy it? Is that a, is that a good, good? Yeah, it was, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's that thing. And, and uh, again, I will continue to say that uh, Cubans aren't my favorite. They're amazing. They're incredible, like any other Dominican or Honduran or Nicaraguan. Um, they're just unique. And when you get something in, you know, that's different and unique, um, it's fun. And yeah. it was yeah. a great cigar. 
Nice. Um, Dave, was there anything else uh, interesting that stood out to you this week? Yeah, I um, had a, I did a lot of these, not only with people that were there, but manufacturers would, instead of uh, a phone call, this is what they did. And I had a call with um, Drew Estates, Jonathan Drew. And I knew I was going to be on the call with him. And I looked through my humidor to say, what am I going to smoke here that maybe he'll pay attention to and notice that I'm smoking? And it was Chateau Real. Do you remember Chateau Real? Oh, oh, yeah. I just didn't. I, I just you talked just about that. just talked about it. Yeah. I just talked because a couple I, re- ago? I remember that it's just one of those cigars that that when it first hit the market, I was just so in love with it. And it's it's uh, it's I, I wish I could smoke them every day, but you know how it is. That was one of my favorites. What a shame. And, and I think we were the biggest seller of Chateau Real because I, it was such perfect cigar for me. I loved it, and I couldn't believe that it went away. And how I got the box of cigars is one of the reps was in some other store and saw a box of cigars sitting there and said, what are you doing? Oh, they've been sitting there forever and stuff. I'll buy it. And he came to me, and he said, hey, I got this. And I said, what do you want for it? And he said, I don't want anything. And he gave it to me. I said, please don't give it to me. I want it, but don't give it to me. And he gave it to me. And <laughs> I, it, it's such a prized possession. Every once in a while, I yep. go in and take one. And it's every bit as good as it was. And there was the opportunity to be, even though we weren't face-to-face, but we were looking at each other on there. I said, let me light the Chateau Real. And he did notice it. And he says, what are you smoking there? And I said, eh, that's what I wanted to happen. Yeah, Chateau Real. Yeah. They, they should come um, back with that. They should come well, back out it, with it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's one of those predicate names that you, you have to, you have to imagine sometime within the next five to 10 years, you know, that's one of those predicate brands that they're going to say, you know, this, this is a brand that people loved and it's a predicate brand that we can release without, with very low risk. So I, I have a feeling we'll probably see that one on the market again someday. Good. Um, my last one this week was uh, uh, an old Roma Craft, uh, the Crow Magnum. When they the first time they brought it, I think it's called the Mode Five. Is the little short Perfecto, mm. uh, and it's this this one was old from back when they first released that new Vitola uh, in that short Perfecto. So I want to say back 2014 uh, is how old that cigar was. But Did no it mellow out. No, I mean a little. Out. A little, but Man. I mean, it's still, it's still got you know everything that you want to get out of a a Cro Magnon. You know, it's it's still got plenty of power behind it. Yeah. So very and very very nice uh, sweetness. Um, you know, to go along with all the heaviness in that cigar too. So, um, so guys, just some closing remarks for those of you who are still watching and listening. We appreciate it so much. Um, we want to let you know that we have some great stuff coming up in the coming weeks. Um, looking forward to May 12th, we're going to talk to Michael Herklotz from Nat Sherman Cigars. Uh, and then uh, following that on, or uh, no, I'm sorry, on May 12th, we're going to talk to Casey and Noah from, oh, yeah. from Char. Char. Uh, they have this new company that's launching right now. It's called Char. They they have uh, some of the most beautiful um, uh, solid wood uh, ashtrays and cigar accessories uh, they are just getting their feet under them. They are just launching. And uh, so we will have them live on the show on May 12th. Uh, and then on the 19th of May, that is when we are going to talk to Michael Herklotz from Nat Sherman Cigars. And we have other stuff in the works for the weeks and months after that. So please keep listening and watching. Uh, Dave, give everybody a little bit more of an idea before we close out here where they can find uh, more about two guys, more about the Cigar Authority. Uh, two guys is in Salem, Seabrook, and Nashville, New Hampshire. We have an online presence, the number two guys, cigars.com. Support your brick and mortar retailer. Don't go to us unless they don't have what we have or uh, they're closed, but please don't come to us. Go to them. And um, the cigarauthority.com, there's a weekly, daily blog that goes on there. Barry Stein fills that out. And we do a Saturday show, uh, noon to 2 o'clock. It's on all the podcast catches, YouTube, if you want to watch our foolishness, or Facebook Live. And uh, we've been doing that for 10 years. And um, that's about it. David versus Goliath, how to compete and beat the online giant. 100 proven promotions for brick-and-mortar retailers at 
Barnes and Noble and all the book places that sell books. Uh, I even saw a, um, a version in um, some Chinese um, oriental country. Uh, I don't know what it is. I couldn't even read the things, but David versus Goliath, I saw. So somebody put it in Mandarin. Somebody put it out in Mandarin. Nice. How crazy awesome. is that? Nice. Yeah, I got to get a hold of one of them myself. Yeah. Well, uh, honestly, we, like I said, we're fans. We, we, we're inspired by you. We, we try mm -hmm. to learn as much from you as we can. I, I know for myself, I am so grateful for all the information that you imparted to us and some of the fun conversation we had tonight on the show. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and we wish you the best in the future. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank all you. right. Yeah, so for you. all of the, all of you guys watching, and especially if you're listening on the audio podcast, whatever it is you do while you listen to audio podcasts, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to listen to us. If you would just take a second and uh, like the podcast, subscribe to us so you won't miss a single episode. We'll, we will be here every Tuesday night. And until we see you guys next time, don't forget, burn cigars, not bridges. Take care, guys. Thank you.